Okay, uh, today we're going to talk about living in the present moment, the difference between thinking and experience. But more importantly, we're going to give you a methodology about how to come to and live in the present moment. Because a lot of people talk about how cool it is to live in the present moment. Um, and uh, they say it's when you're at ease. I don't think your mic is on. It isn't. I, I didn't. Can you not hear me back there? Barely. Oh. Okay. We're going to talk about living, how we get to the present moment. Because if you don't know how to get there, all the good things I'm going to tell you about how extraordinary it is when you are there don't make any sense because you can't get there. And actually, I was talking to somebody who was in a men's group last night, and they were talking about, you know, why did you come to the present moment, but they had no idea how to get there. So, the first thing I want to ask you is um, how many of you, when I say the present moment, I've been working with this for 25, 30 years. Um, so I have my own definition of being in the present moment. And being in the present moment is fully participating in this moment with all of your attention focused. Hi, Melvin! This is my dear friend. I try. I, I try to come here as often as I can, but at least once or twice a year uh, to be of service to Melbourne because he is just such an extraordinary human being. Um, they uh, broke the mold after Melbourne, really, seriously. So. Okay, so being in the present moment, living in the here and the now. Um, all of your attention participating, listening to the information from your millions and billions of cells that are in your body. Because when we think about something, we move in time. So when we're thinking about something, it has got to be an abstraction because it's always about something. So when you're in thought, you get data. And when you're in your experience, you get in formation, which is pattern. So you actually experience things differently, you see things differently, you organize information differently, and it's a very extraordinary place to be because you are dealing with nature. You're dealing with how nature does things and how nature sees things. When you think about something, you're, you're dealing with how other people have created systems about what they think the world is about. Okay? And that's okay, too. But then there's good old nature, which sort of has given us our four billion year old, old skill set of how to get on in this world. Like I have a cat, and my cat is named Marley. After Bob Marley, and he's just an adorable little Himalayan cat, and I just love him. And when he decides he's going to clean himself, he just begins. He doesn't say, Well, this is not the appropriate time to clean myself because there are people in the room or whatever. Or he decides that he's going to uh, jump up and take my cell phone and knock it off the counter, okay? He doesn't say, Oh, well, I can't do that because then she'll punish me or whatever, or, you know, kind of a thing to do. He just does what cats do. Um, and uh, lions do what lions do. And people really know how to do what people know how to do. They really do know how to get on in this world. And then we learn not to listen to that, but to listen to what other people tell us we're supposed to do. Okay? So, we are going to find our way back to that place where we're going to listen to what our body tells us to do for the four billion year old skill set that we have about how to be a human. So we are going to get information, we are going to get pattern, we are going to choose to think when we want to. Okay, but we're going to live in the present moment. So when I I'm going to ask you a question. How many of you have ever taken a shower? Shower? Okay. So when I mean take a shower, I mean you're in the shower. You're feeling the warmth of the water on your skin. You're smelling the olfactory nature of the soap and the, and, the, and the beautiful sensory smell that it has. You feel the water under your feet. Or are you in the shower saying, just because I've got to keep it done at 3 o'clock and I have to go do that, or I have to go to the dentist at 4 o'clock, or how am I going to be my loan, or she told me she loved me, how come she's not here, or whatever it is that you're doing, okay? 
So how many of you now have ever really truly taken a shower? Just been in the shower? Oh, that's good. Okay, that's really good. Um, I always take a bath, so the guy would say that, that this whole exercise doesn't apply to me. So anyway, so um, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about being fully present in every moment, totally participating. And if you're not present, where could you possibly be? <laughs> you could be in the future, worrying about what's going to happen. Or you could be in the past, regretting what happened and trying to fix it. Or you could be focused on other people, and you can be judging them, and hating them, and comparing them. Or you could be doing this negative self-talk, which constricts infinite possibilities to just a few little things, like I'm too tall, or I'm too short, or I'm not smart enough, or I don't have enough money, or I have too much money, or whatever. So what we're going to do is we're going to show you how thought, because it is an abstraction, can never be in the present moment. And we are always thinking. We are always thinking. We get up thinking, we brush our teeth thinking, we are driving the car with thinking, when we're in chemistry class with thinking, when we're uh, at the, at the, at the uh, where we eat. What's the name of the person we eat uh, over here? Is that it? What? Yeah, whatever the hall is over there. We're thinking, and um, so we don't know how to stop thinking, right? Seriously, what, what, do you, what do you imagine life would be like if you could just be, if you could just totally participate in this moment and have this moment be the impetus for the next moment and then fully be in that moment and have that be the impetus for the next moment and choose to think when you have to. So for example, I'm flying home tomorrow, I live in Miami, and I just moved there, it's very, very cool. I moved there July 1st, and I'm so happy. Um, but I have to make this place, so I, have to, I had to this morning leave my moment so that I could get my ticket, you know, my boarding pass so that I could board the plane tomorrow. So but I was very conscious of leaving my moment, going to the computer, doing it tomorrow morning, and then getting my boarding pass, and then coming back to the present moment. I know most of the time, 98% of the time, where I am moment by moment by moment, okay? So if we talk about, by the way, if anybody has any questions, you can just, uh, I hate raising hands, so but there's a lot of you, so if you could just let me know that you want to ask me a question. I, this is a really interactional kind of a talk, so I would really like to hear from you. And when I present the model that I'm going to show you after I present the model, if you don't ask questions, I point. Okay, so um, that's my that's my uh, cheeky style, like you. Okay, so um, so what I want to do is I want to present you a model of how to find the present moment. Okay, so how did I learn about how to find the present moment? Well, it came to me in a very unusual way. I have a master's and a PhD in psychology. I have a master's in clinical psych and a PhD in counseling psych. And I managed to get through my entire educational experience without taking one physics class. Not one. Not one in elementary school, not one in high school, not one in college, not one in graduate school. Because a physics was for the smart people, okay? They were, I went to Boston College, so they were across the river and they did all these little sort of little equation things with numbers. I had trouble adding, so I wasn't even going close to physics, okay? But I did live in Cambridge, Massachusetts at the time. And they had this, because in Cambridge, everybody must learn. You must learn how old you are, young you are, uh, you know, um, how many kids you have, it doesn't matter. You have to be learning all the time. So uh, they had this thing called Cambridge Adult Education, where you had all these courses that you can take. And it's a big book like this. And so I decided to do this random thing where I'm going to open the book and I'm going to point. I thought I would get quilting or, you know, photography or something like that. So what do I get? I get quantum physics and the face of God. Okay? A light course to take. <laughs> so I decided I'm going to take quantum physics and the face of God, expecting that I would know nothing and I would be stupid. And I wouldn't understand anything. And the course was given by Fred Allen Wolf. I don't know whether any of you have ever seen the movie What's the Belief? Do you know anything about What's the Belief? Yes. What the bleep, what the bleep do we know, right? <laughs> and down the rabbit hole was the second one. No one else knows about what to believe? 
Oh, you can get it on the internet for free. You don't even have to pay for it anymore. It's a phenomenal movie. And it's got, it's got a storyline. And the storyline is that this woman, she's married to this man. She comes home and she finds her husband in bed with another man. And so she starts drinking and taking pills. And she's a photographer, and she, they, she goes to work that day, and they give her an assignment. She has to uh, shoot this wedding in a church where she got married. So she starts drinking more, and she's more pills, and she's all that. And that's the, sort of the storyline of the movie. But every five minutes, the, the movie is interrupted by a quantum physicist who tells you what's going on in the quantum world, and then also by these little cartoon characters that tell you what's going on in your biology as well. So the guy, the last guy, uh, the physicist that talks at the end, looks sort of like Einstein's hair is all like this, and his name is Fred Allen Wolf, and he was the gentleman who taught me about the extraordinary information, information you can get from quantum physics. And basically what he told me was that physicists understand how one object relates to another object using the dimensions of time and space. So I said, wow, time and space? What's that? <laughs> um, and then he said that you could, um, you could understand and get people to the moon and you could create atomic bombs, you could do all this stuff by figuring out how time and space works. So I said, wow, that's really cool. I said, maybe I'll apply that to my area of expertise, which is human folk, and we're going to see how, how time and space affects how people relate to themselves. So I drew a model. Uh, where the horizontal line is time. And the vertical line is space. And it's at the intersection of time and space that we are in the present moment. Because Einstein said that time and space are not separate, but are interconnected. So we are in the present moment, we are in the here and the now. A more personal way to say here and now is I am. Okay, so here we are right in the present moment in the I am. Now, what, what was so profound to me was that I, I, I got this aha. And you, know, you get that, like Einstein got his aha about the nature of relativity while he was washing dishes. Well, I got mine, uh, I think I was taking a walk or something like that, and I said, wait a minute, the words I am are time-space words. Am is a present tense verb that lets you know that you're in the now, and I is a pronoun that lets you know where your attention is focused, and when you're in the I am, your attention is focused on your multi-sensory data. So I said, oh my goodness, we can use words to orient ourselves in time and space. So if we're going this way on the timeline and we're in the future, what are some of the words in our language that let us know that we're in the future? Would be will, might, what if, could, right? And where did I see those words before? Well, I saw those words in two places. Well, somebody tried to show me those words, but I usually cut those classes. The first class that they showed me trying to show me those words was like when I was speaking to uh, learning to speak Spanish. And they did tenses and pronouns and then did the proof perfect participle and the past tense and the subjective tense. And that's when I cut that class and went across the street and had Pete then on the show because I would be staying around for tenses. Had they told me that tenses oriented me in time, I might have listened. The other place where they talked to you about tenses is an English class. Oh my God, did you hate English class? I hated English class. I never wanted to stay around for English class. It was about English class things, and I know English, so what do I have to know English for? They do tenses there, they do syntax. This is my new favorite word. I have a new favorite word, everyone. It's called syntax. It's how words are put together to create meaning, okay? But anyway, I'm going to come back to that in a minute. So if we're in the present moment, we go this way on the timeline, we go to the future, and some of the words are will, might, what it could. If we're on this way, we go to the um, past, and some of the words that let us know that we're in the past are did, was, the coulda, woulda, should haves. Do we have that one? Most of the people get the timeline. They don't uh, have so much trouble with the timeline. It's the space line that they have difficulty with. And the space line is where you put your attention. Okay, so we're going to do a little process right now just so you can get to my idea of what I'm talking about. 
So we have these three things. We have this lectern that some of the professors stand behind. And then we have this board, this white uh, um, loose leaf, uh, news leaf board, and then we have this board, okay? So whenever you I need to put all their attention on this, okay? Now take it off that and put it on this white board. Now take it off that and put it on the black board. Now take it off that and try to put it back on me. Did you feel that you have the capacity to choose where to put your attention? Did you actually feel that? Everybody raise their hand and felt it. Okay? There's an Ellie song. So, um, you can choose where to put your attention. Okay? Keep that in the back because you're going to use that a little later in the talk. So if you are in the present moment, you're listening to the billions of cells that are in your body. Your cells are very smart, and we'll talk about that for a little bit too. It's a wonderful book by Bruce Lipton called The Biology of Belief that if you haven't ever had nothing else to do, you might want to read that book. But it's really a good book, and it talks about how smart our cells are. So when we're not focused on all of this information that's going on in our body, we're focused outside of, of ourselves, and we call that other people or things. And some of the words that let us know that we're doing other people or things are he, she, they, and things would be the grades, right? It would be in business, it would be the third quarter results. If you own a home, it would be the mortgage, okay? So that's outside of yourself. And when you're in the present moment, you realize that you are infinite, and it's a lot about scale. I just finished reading a great book on cosmology and also the book the biology of belief on microbiology. So we have this scale of millions of years and, and large things out there and teeny, teeny, tiny things out here. And we recognize that we are as vast from the skin inward as the universe is from the skin out. But when we go down the space line, we focus inward, but we only focus on a couple of things. And usually there are things that are wrong with us, like I'm too tall, or I'm too short, or I'm too old, or I'm too young, or whatever. And we call that negative stuff. Okay. Does everybody understand this part? Is, everybody, is, this, is this clear? If it's not clear, yes, yeah, sir. It's clear. Yay! Out of way. I was sure you were going to say something else. I don't know. Got me on that one. Thank you. Okay. Um, so this is the first part of the model. And uh, I'm going to present the second part of the model, and then I'm going to talk to you about thought and how we're going to use thought and decompose it in certain ways to be able to listen to the words rather than the, than the, uh, the context or the pattern that comes from the organization of the words. But let's start with this. We all have biological needs, like when we're hungry, right? We get a multi-sensory indicator, like our stomach growls or our stomach, we get stomach pains. We know we have to act on our environment to go get something to eat, right? We don't have a thought about that. We might think about what we're going to eat, but we know we're going to get something to eat, right? Just like we have biological needs, so too we have emotional states, and those emotional states are to be secure, in control, and adequate. And we maintain these emotional states through the processes of focus, choice, and clarity. Now, just like we have a multi-sensory indicator that lets us know when we're hungry, we also have a multi-sensory indicator that lets us know when we need to focus, when we need to make a different choice, or when we need to close an experience and come to the present moment clear. Those indicators are called feelings. Okay? Now, only one more digression, and then I will continue going forward. There's a wonderful theoretical physicist. All of a sudden, I really became very, these physicists are very cool, and they're now my buds. They say, teach me things. They're very excited. And uh, the, the guy's name is David Bohm. And he said the following quote. And I'm just going to say it. I really would like you not to think about it. Just try and experience it. And he says that thought is a system created by a culture evolving over time. Yes? Got that. Okay. Thought is a system created by a culture 
evolving over time. And in that system, it creates what we value. It creates what we think is good, and we create what we think is bad. And what our culture has done is has taken the multi-sensory experiences that allow us to focus, make authentic choices, and be clear and stay in the I am, and charge them negatively. Okay, so the feeling that lets us focus is anxiety. The feeling that lets us make a different choice is frustration. And the feeling that lets us close an experience is sadness. And I'm just going to give you one example because of, because of time, in terms of how the culture does this. So a little kid comes home from school and says to mommy and daddy, Mommy and daddy, I'm so anxious about this test tomorrow. I really want to do good and I'm really anxious. I get all these butterflies in my stomach and everything. And mommy and daddy say, don't be anxious. You're going to be great. Okay, we're going to make our cards and we're going to study. So you know all stuff here. You don't need to be anxious. So after two or three years of hearing you're not supposed to be anxious, that when the anxiety feeling comes up, you don't pay attention to it because you can choose what to pay attention to. The only difficulty with that is that the feeling has to be discharged. And if it's not going to be discharged to execute, to focus, or make different choices or close an experience, it's got to be discharged some way. So the feeling says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to create a thought because thoughts are okay in this culture, and I'm going to piggyback myself on this thought, and that's how I'm going to get discharged. So the feelings exist in the present moment. Here's anxiety, here's frustration, and here's sadness. Okay? When anxiety gets put onto a thought, it takes us into the future, and is experienced as worry or fear. When frustration gets creates a thought, it takes us to other people and things or negative self-talk and is experienced as anger, judgment, comparison, and negation. And when sadness creates a thought, it takes us into the past and is experienced as regret, guilt, or shame. So this model says that regret, guilt, shame, Anger, judgments, negations, comparisons, worry, fear, and negative self-talk are all illusions. They are only there to discharge a feeling. And so what happens though, we pay attention to the content of that thought as if it was a real thought that we were choosing to create to solve a problem. So we can't differentiate what is a thought created to discharge a feeling and what is a thought created to solve a problem. So what we're, what we're going to do is we're going to start to maintain a level of consciousness about where we are in time and space, and this is very important. So let's say, I, and this is where my favorite word comes back here, syntax. So what I say is, let's say I say to Greg, Greg, I think you're a very special person, right? So tell me what you what I mean when I say I think Greg is a very special person. If nobody raises their hand, I'm pointing, and you people are in the front or close. So uh, what do you think I mean when I say Greg is a very special person? Yeah, there you go. special. Has <laughs> good qualities. Yeah, he has good qualities. Yeah, good qualities. Somebody who you like. Somebody who I like, right? Okay. But I guarantee you that you didn't hear the words that created that sentence. So, cred is a word, is is a word, special is a word, and person is a word. You took that and you made, gave it a meaning, right? You gave it a meaning. What I want you to do is I want you to make a conscious choice to focus on the actual bricks and mortar of thought, which are words, all right? Some of those words will be time words, and some of those words will be space words. So you will begin to start to create a compass as to where you are in time and space. And if you haven't, ch if you haven't chosen to go out there, you know that that thought was created by a feeling. You come back to your body, feel the feeling, and guess what? You're back to the present moment. 
Does it cost any money? Does it take any time? And you are here, and you're open to the infinite missions of possibility, and you're open to ease, and you're open to relationship, and you're open to beauty, and you're open to gratitude, and you're open to integrity, and you're open to, and I go on and on and on and on and on and on and on, what happens in the present moment. So, how do we get there? What is the compass? The compass is words. But no one ever hears words, they only hear the idea that the words form. Do you get what I just said? It's, it's really huge. Okay? I want you to choose because you know you can choose where to put your attention. You just did it here. Okay? I want you to choose to shift your attention to words rather than ideas. And use those words as a compass to figure out where you are in time and space and then to ask yourself, did I consciously make a choice to do this, to go out there, and if you did it, you're driven by one of these feelings, you come back and feel the feeling, and you're right here. It's miraculous. Doesn't cost any money, doesn't take any time. Do you know how much... Oh, there's another physics principle, I'm telling you the dudes are really good, that in which... They say that there's only X amount of energy in the universe. It can have a different form. It could be gas or liquid or solid. But it's only X. So do you, and then let's say you have X energy every day to, to do everything that you have to do. Do you know how much energy it takes to take a feeling, to create a thought, to take it out there, then to call your friend and tell you about, your friend about that thought, and then to look it up on the internet and do it? You're, you're using your energy in the wrong place. That's why you're exhausted all the time. You think you're exhausted all the time because you don't get very much sleep. I'm telling you, I think you're exhausted many of the times because you're using your energy in the wrong place. <coughs> but I, again, I don't want you to believe me. What I really want you to do is I want you to try this. I want you to try it for 30 days like a money-back guarantee. Okay? Can you always go back to thinking. I'm telling you. Piece of cake. Those, those synaptic junctions are very deep. But what I want you to do, the very first thing I want you to do is I want you to just start to become aware that your thoughts are made up of words. And that those words can prove very valuable to you because they can give you where you are in time and space and uh, as a compass to get you back here. If you do nothing else, just start to become aware of where you are in time and space because you haven't chosen to go out there most of the time. Most of the time you're out there because a feeling that the culture has negatively valued has created that thought for you. Okay? Um, can you tell me what this looks like? What, what, what's, what's, what's going on in your head when you're... When you hit a phone like this, you say, what is she talking about? Is, it, <laughs> is that what's going on? No. Huh? No. Who said no? Yeah. No, I wasn't on you, but, but you answered, so there you go. Okay. So, now, are you, are you getting this? Yes. Okay. How does it feel? It feels great. It feels great. Good. No, seriously. Absolutely. It feels really great when you're not in the matrix. It feels really good when you are out of the matrix, and it feels very good when you arrive and you are an avatar. <laughs> Seriously, because when you are in the present moment, you know in your body, in your soul, in your DNA, in your cell membranes, that you are connected to every living thing. You know that you have to live with these five drivers. There are only five drivers of human behavior. You want to know what they are? Doesn't matter, I'm going to tell you anyway. So, they are service, compassion, integrity, accountability, and courage. If you are driven by one of those five drivers, no problem. Okay? When you are in the present moment, you are always driven by those five drivers. I said that loudly on purpose. <laughs> and so when you, all you have to do, all you have to do is re-reference yourself in time and space to come back to the present moment. 
And then you will be driven by those five drives. And you will be at ease and you will be grateful. And you will be extraordinarily proud that you have a life. Most people don't recognize the value of their life till they don't have it or some of it or get around to possibly losing it in some way. You have an opportunity to have that gratitude before and if it happens to you, because you all look pretty healthy to me. Okay? So, how are we doing? What's going on? What's shaking? What's moving? Because now we get to the real part, which is, I can't teach unless I hear where you are. So, again, who has any questions? Because if yes. No, no, no. No questions? Yes. But you need to say it so everybody can hear you. That's all. <laughs> I just had a question in regards to the human drivers. Yes. I can't pass all five. Okay, you want me to say them again? Yes. Service. Compassion. Integrity. Accountability. And courage. Okay. Who has a question? Because if you don't have questions, I'm pointing. Seriously, you you already you already went so I'm not going to point at you. You yes. Um, I have a question. Yes. Um, you said, okay, so I have no problem with being the present moment, but then when you have like your parents telling you, oh my God, what are you doing? You're having too much fun. You need to work. You can't play all the time. You know, what are you going to do for a career in the future? Retirement funds, working, blah blah. It's like. Yeah, I don't want to be like the grasshopper, you know, so. Okay. Let me, um, let me first tell you about the truth of the present moment, okay? In the truth of the present moment, you are moment by moment happy. But the root verb of the word happiness is to happen. So you're fully experiencing what is happening. That doesn't always mean that you're partying. It doesn't always mean it, but you are fully experiencing what is happening. And I'm not telling you not to play it. I'm just telling you not to be attached to it because it never is like that. Because you're planning from position A, and the plan is supposed to be executed at position Z, and there's a real world that comes in here between A and Z. So how much effort shall we put over here when we know it's not going to be that way? I can guarantee you that if you make a plan, right, by the time you execute that plan, it will not look like a plan you made there. Okay, so plan, but understand not to be attached to it because life happens. Right? The other thing is, <clears throat> when the sperm hit the egg, you became you, right? So it was your mama and your dad, okay, that had to be in the right place at the exact time doing something really good so that you are around, okay? So that what you need to do to your mommy and your daddy is you need to love them because they made you. You don't always have to listen to them, but you need to love them, and you need to cherish them, and you need to be in service of them because they're your mom and your dad, and that's it. It's as simple as that. It's not going to get any more complicated. Yes, sir. Um, when we were talking about security and like the in control and stuff like yes. that, are you like making reference to like Maslow's hierarchy of needs and like having self-actualization as like being in the moment? Those were about 25 concepts that you use. I don't do concepts real good. I'm really not a good conceptual person. I have a friend of mine. Oh, I'm not going to say that because I'm from the university. But anyway, yes. If you want to use Maslow's hierarchy of needs, when you're in the present moment, you have a lot. Okay, because you recognize the value and the exquisiteness of having a life. And all you want to do is be driven by your five drivers. You want to be of service because in order to receive, you must give. Yes? We got a butt. We got a butt. Okay. Can you be in the moment without, like, having, with, with having concerns, like, you still have stuff you need to worry about? And, like, no, I, don't, I do not. I do not. I do not worry about anything. No, I do not. 
My definition of fear is the inability to execute on what you have to do now. If you're executing on what you have to do now, then you're executing on what you have to do now, and that will take you to where you need to go. All right? What fear does is it paralyzes you from executing. Because all the energy is going into one thing. Oh my God, and, oh, I'll never be, and I can't do that, and I'll never be able to do that. And, oh, it's, it's, it's nauseating, frankly. And actually, I'm, I'm going to use my friend, my friend Lucy came in, and so I'm going to use what, what she says is my favorite word. It's ridiculous! <laughs> you don't have to do it. That's the best part of the whole thing, is that you don't have to do it. And where I learned that, I got my first glimmer of that, believe it or not, a real, real long time ago, at one of these help, help, self-help things called S. You know, anybody remember S? It's now the forum or something. But it was a two-weekend uh, deal up in Boston, and you got there Friday night, and you, went, you stayed till Sunday morning, and you had to stay up at 2 o'clock in the day. They deprived you of sleep and food, and you couldn't go to the bathroom. They tried to knock out your sensory experiences and, so that, that some information would come in. But the truth is, is that after the end of the two-week period, um, the, the two-weekend period, the guy in the car said, if anybody didn't get it, raise their hand. Okay, so I raised my hand. And my then husband at the time said to me, sit down. I said, I will not sit down. I didn't get it. And I spent two weekends here, and I'm not going to leave not get it. And I, really, the guy said, if you don't get it, raise your hand. So I raised my hand, and somebody came over to me. I don't know what he did. But for, the, for a moment, I said, oh, my God. You mean I'm putting that stuff in my head? You can't be serious. I'm putting that stuff in my head? I can choose not to put that stuff in my head? Wow. Okay, so that's when I started my journey to find a methodology to teach people how not to do that. And that, the result of that, is the model. You can really be in a place where you can choose to be present and listen to how to be a human being. And sometimes you have to go to the future. We live in a society. Sometimes you have to go to the past. Sometimes you want to focus on other people. But it's 2% of the time, not 98% of the time. Questions? How are you feeling about this? Mm-hmm. So, are you going to walk out of here and be able to live in the present moment? No trying. You want to know how many times I've tried to stop smoking? Huh. You don't even know. <laughs> and then, until I finally stopped, I must have tried for 50 times. So, there's no trying. You, you, you need to execute on this. You need to shift your attention from the concepts to the words, use the words to find out where you are in time and space, and use where you are in time and space to connect to the feeling. Once you start using these feelings again, they'll take over and you won't even need to know where you are in time and space, because when you're in the present moment, there is no time and space. Truly. It's infinite. Yes, ma'am. I just want to know, how can you be sure that you are living in that here and now? What? Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I'll hold it. I have so many things in my hands. Look at this. <laughs> um, the way that you know that you're in the present moment is that you are in gratitude moment by moment by moment. I mean, it's the way that you live your life. You live it in absolute gratitude. Um, it, it's, it's how you know. And it's, you're looking around for places to be of service. And you would never not live in integrity. Your word is your deed. And you would have courage to stand in what you believe. I was in a mystery school once. I've uh, been in two mystery schools. And at the end of the... Uh, two, two good stories about mystery school. But at the end of the first mystery school, is where you discover the mysteries. You know, how come when the phone rings, you know who it is? <laughs> or how come, you know, you miss that plane and that plane went down and you're still here? Those are the mysteries. So it's a mystery school. And at the very end of mystery school, we had to say what we liked about ourselves. And it's easy to say what we don't like, but it's not really so easy to say what we like about yourself. So what I said was that I could stand in who I am despite the judgments of others. And that's courageous because when you're a pioneer and you're trying to shift paradigms, you're going to get a lot of judgments. Okay? 
The second uh, part uh, I want to tell you of, of another story about Mr. School before I ask, uh, ask another question is that in order to go to Mr. School, you had to take five prerequisite courses. Right? So I took two of the prerequisite courses, and I had a PhD, so I thought, that, well, that, that's going to get me in. Right? And I managed to figure out, I went to an assistant facilitator, and I, she got me in. So I'm at the course, and I'm, we're doing the assignment, so I do my assignment. And I'm standing up there, and I'm just really, really cool about my assignment. And the facilitator says, how did you get here? I said, what do you mean? I took two courses, and then I had a PhD, so that allows me to get in. She says, not only don't you know me, but you don't know that you don't know anything, which is real bad, right? And so then I thought I was going to leave, okay? And then she said, oh, no, you're not leaving. You got yourself here, okay? But you are going to come to this with a beginner's eye because you don't know anything about the mysteries. You might know something about a PhD in psychology, but you don't know anything about the mysteries and energetics and how the soul works and blah, 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 and all the wonderful things you learn in mysteries. But this stuff is being in the present moment and experiencing that over a, a significant amount of time is really something that many of us don't know. We don't know that we don't even know it. You know, we, we actually live, you know, I've said it before, I got a joke out of it, we actually do live in a matrix. We do not come from a place of choice. We do not uh, create our own value system. We do not um, be of service. We do not share. We just don't do it. I mean, it's just, we don't do it. I was in uh, Miami last week, and I was walking on South Beach, and there was this very expensive apartment. I took this, I don't know, it was a car, but it looked, I don't know what, it, I mean, it was really an amazing thing. I found out that it was a kind of a car, like a Bucati car, or something like that. What, what is it? Bugatti. A Bugatti, uh, right. And it costs, you know how much that car costs? $250,000 for a car that if they were on the road with me, they would be in deep trouble because I would probably hit it. Okay? I've done that before. So what I'm trying to say is that people spend $250,000 for a car? Spend $100,000. And you give me $150,000, I'll give it to a lot of people. Or just give it to a lot of people. It's absurd. Seriously, but we value that in our culture. She even knew the name of it. I was close. <laughs> I was really close. All right, just got a question about how to get there. I don't want to talk about so much anymore. What, what little time I have left, which is about five minutes, is I want you to know how to get there. Because once you get there, you'll know you're there. Okay, so you asked us to become aware of the thoughts that... Um, that are made up of words yes. and figure out where you are yes. in time and space. Yes. So can you go into a little more detail where to direct yourself? Yes, very good. Excellent. Okay. So if you if you have a sentence that says, what if I can't get it done by tomorrow? Okay? So you do it, what if? So what if takes you to the future? You're already in tomorrow. What if I can't get it done tomorrow? Okay? So you say, well, okay, did I choose to create that sentence? If I didn't create that sentence with a high degree of probability, what I'm feeling is anxious. Okay? So let me come back and experience my anxiety. Anxiety sits in the pit of your stomach. It's these butterfly kinds of things, etc. Once you turn your attention from what if to your tummy, okay? and you focus your energy on that experience of anxiety, you are back here, and guess what you do? You focus, and of course you'll get it done by tomorrow. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, I really, truly have to tell you that this is the truth. Because what happens is, is that when you're anxious, and you experience that anxiety, and then it leads to you to focus concomitantly, simultaneously, you stop being hungry, you stop being tired, and you get the thing done. Yes? You, did you have such an experience in your life once or twice? Um, yeah. yeah. Can you talk about it? I oh, know. Just every day when I do work, I just I feel a little anxious, and then I just focus and I get it done. Yep. Absolutely. The anxiety. Every actor and actress, no matter how many times they go on the stage, okay, always feel anxious before they do their performance because it allows them to focus. Anxiety is is another one of my favorite words. A yummy feeling. 
It's not negative. There are more people on anti-anxiety drugs in this country than any other drug. Of course, they don't want us to focus. Because if we focus and make good choices and we're clear, then we're self-powered, which is the name of my book. And then we don't need other people to tell us what to do. We can make really good human choices and be driven by how many drivers are there? Five drivers. What are they? Can you say them? Service, compassion, integrity, accountability, and courage. Yay. Yay. Okay. Uh, uh, one more question. Come on. Yes. How to avoid conflict. Ah, I got the great answer for this. I love when I have it. Because what you want and value in your life is ease, not being right. That's how you avoid conflict. You want to fight with me? You're right. Because I, if I don't, if I fight with you, I'm not at ease. And if I don't, and if I'm not at ease, too many things. If I'm not at ease, then I create this very Interesting thing. I create dis ease. I create dis ease on a biological level, on a psychological level, on a sociological level, on a global level, on a planetary level, and above. So you want to argue with me? You're right. I will not argue. Because I'm for ease. Yes. They didn't, they didn't fight. They lived their work. They lived, they lived, the way to, the, the way to change society, you know, I hate to use the, the, the old cliche, but, but it, it works, God damn it, which is be the change you want to see. That's what they did. Right. Um, it definitely was a fight. There's no question about that. I use the example of the dentist. Okay, you know, when you first went to a dentist a hundred years ago, and you had a tooth out, they took a pliers and they pulled the goddamn thing out, right? Then they developed a drill. But you sort of wish they would have had the pliers because the drill was so painful. Then they developed Novocaine. So at least you just kind of shot a little pain when you had Novocaine, and then you will get Now, they have happy gas. So now we call them to go to the dentist, okay? What I'm saying is, is that at that point in time, when the Civil War was occurring, okay, that's what we knew. We did the best with what we knew. But we know so much more now, even though we just know a teeny tiny bit, okay? But we so, know so much more now than we did then. So you can't, you have to use different <coughs> methodologies to solve problems than we used in the Civil War. Although some people in the South are still fighting that one. My, my son went to Clemson. Oh, yes, in the war, Confederate flag, all, all the places. It's interesting. Okay, um, I think it's about 10 of 1. It, I, uh, thank you all for coming, and I enjoyed it. Practice, practice, practice. <laughs>